right. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Tushar Mehta. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and a faculty of orthopedics at DAMS. And uh, I welcome you all to the answers and solution of this uh, uh, computer-based test of orthopedics. So let's start. First question, paprika sign uh, during deprivement is crucial in management of which of the following? All right. So we are talking about paprika sign during deprivement. Guys, you have to understand that this is a classical sign which is seen in this condition called as chronic osteomyelitis. Let me give you a brief on that. Now what happens is, I'll be showing you the figures also. What happens in chronic osteomyelitis that uh, there is a lot of uh, infection and dead bone inside. I'm sure you guys know what the dead bone is. That is called sequestrum. Now the point is that chronic osteomyelitis is mainly managed surgically. So the job of an orthopedic surgeon is actually to go inside that bone and try to drill that bone. Now just imagine if the bone is dead inside, what will come out? The ischemic necrotic bone along with the pus inside the bone. Okay, so we are drilling it, we are, we are doing the curettage, we are making small small drill holes, but what is coming out is just an infected necrotic uh, bone with the you know, element of pus. <clears throat> But now what I want you to understand is that the moment you, you know, start making drill holes at one point of time, you see there are certain punctured bleeding spots. So I'm just doing the drilling part and every time there is a ischemic necrotic bone with pass. But this time when I drilled a hole inside the bone, I could see small uh, blood oozing out. I could see the punctured bleeding spots. And that means that the underlying bone bed is now viable. It is vital. It is healthy. It is having blood. Uh, the benefit of doubt for its survival should be given it should not be taken out that is what is called as paprika sign so appearance of this punctured bleeding spots during extended curettage and multiple drill holings of the bone undergoing chronic osteomyelitis is called as paprika sign i hope that makes sense to you now coming to the second question which is the most probable cause of the deformity shown in the child in this image? Let's see the deformity now. Wonderful. Now, what do you think is this deformity? Let's make it very simple. I hope you have understood that this side is having a deformity called as genovirus. And at the same time, I'm sure, my God, this side is deformity, what is called as genovalgus. While this side, you have a deformity called as genovirus. Now, guys, I'm sure you are aware of the fact that when do we call anything as virus and valgus or genovirus and genovalgus. See, you have to understand when I say genovirus, that does not mean that the geno or the knee will go into virus. It means that the part distal to geno. The part distal to geno is the leg, the tibia and the fibula. If they go towards midline, that is called genovirus. If they go away from the midline, we call it genovalgus. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, what is this condition in which you have a combo pack, you have a hybrid model where you have genovirus on one side, where you have genovalgus on the other side, this is what is called as Hava ka joka aya aur uda ke le gaya. This is what is called as wind swept deformity. Alright, this is what is called as wind swept deformity. Now the interesting part is that the most common cause of wind swept deformity, the most common cause of wind swept deformity, particularly in children, is rickets. But when we talk about adults, it is in particular rheumatoid arthritis. In adults, it is basically rheumatoid arthritis. All right. So in children, it is rickets. But when we talk about adults, it is rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I think that, you know, probably it's a child. So answer has to be simple. Answer has to be D, rickets. <coughs> Question number three, Z score measures the BMD compared to. See guys, when we talk about DEXA scan, when we talk about dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, all right, or what we call as DEXA scan. In DEXA scan, of course, we know that we calculate the bone mineral density, all right. In DEXA scan, it is absolutely clear that we calculate the BMD, we calculate the bone mineral density. Now what I want you to remember is that in DEXA scan there are two scores. One is called as the T score, the other one is called as the Z score or the Z score. Now guys you have to understand that when you compare sex with sex like 
T score is that when you compare the BMD of a female to another female. When you compare BMD of an Asian female to another Asian female, we call it a T score. But when you compare BMD of a female to a female, when you compare Asian female to an Asian female, and when you compare a 60-year-old Asian female to another 60-year-old Asian female, then we call it a Z score. I hope you understood my point. So if you keep the sex as constant, the race is constant, that is T score. But if you keep sex, if you keep sex, race and age, all three as constant, that is what we call as T score. But mind you, my dear students, the plan, the practical application is always of T score. In fact, WHO says that osteoporosis is WHO says that osteoporosis is T score less than minus 2.5. That is the WHO standard definition of osteoporosis. <clears throat> so, simple question with a simple answer. Answer is A. Because age, sex and race, all three have to be matched. Question number four. All of the following are components of terrible shred of Hotchkiss itself. Uh, guys, here I would like you to know that there are certain triads which are important. Like there is one triad which is important and famous both. O. Donog Hughes unhappy tribe. All right, so that is O. Donog Hughes O. Donog Hughes unhappy tribe. All right. Now, when we talk about O. Donog Hughes unhappy tribe, this is actually injury to ACL, injury to MCL, injury to MN. Who do not use unhappy tribe means injury to these three elements together. Then we have something which is called as Hotchkiss Terrible Tried. And when we talk about Hotchkiss Terrible Tried, this again has three things. One is called as the posterior elbow dislocation. The second one is called as the fracture in head of radius. The third one is the fracture coronoid <coughs> process of ulna. Then I hope that you guys remember that we have a triad of Klippel field syndrome as well. Now guys, when we talk about a triad of Klippel field syndrome, it has got short webbed neck. Okay, it has low hairline low posterior hairline and it has decreased mobility at neck and a very interesting point is that short stature a very very interesting point is that short stature is not a part of the trial okay so this is answer is very simple fracture of the radial head is not a part of the Hotchkiss terrible trial I have already mentioned that Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my apology. Fracture of the radial head is a part of the triad, my apologies. Posterior elbow dislocation is a part. Fracture of coronoid process is a part. Fracture of olecranon is not a part. Now, question number five. Now, this is an X-ray, distal tibia, distal fibula, lesion extending into the distal tibia and the fibula, not only in the metaphysical area, but extending up to the diaphysical area. And I don't know why, but I think this is more or less the sunray appearance and sunburst appearance. I think so it is classical sunburst, sunburst appearance of osteosarcoma. It looks as if it is osteosarcoma. And yes, they have mentioned in the question also, sunray appearance in osteosarcoma is due to, uh, it is due to periosteal reaction along Sharpie's fibers. Always remember this. Many misguide books have mentioned the answer as you know, it has some calcification along the vessel, it has some blood vessel formation. No. It is simple and clear. It is periosteal reaction along Sharpie's fibers. All right. So this is simple periosteal reaction along Sharpie's fibers. So this is a sunray appearance of osteosarcoma. All right. This is a sunray appearance of osteosarcoma, which is basically the periosteal reaction along the Sharpie's fibers. Question number six, which of the following bones does not form the wrist? See, now you have to understand that radius is an important part of wrist. Scaphoid is again an important part of wrist. Lunate is an important part of wrist. Even triquitrum is an important part of wrist. 
there is a there is a articular disc of ulna there is a small articular disc of ulna here that is also so this articular disc of ulna is important this radius is important in making a wrist scaphoid is important lunate is important trichotrum is important so what is not at all contributing to the formation of wrist ulna as such you understood my point so one is radius two is scaphoid three is lunate four is trichotrum five is articular disc of ulna but what is not a part of uh, the wrist joint it is ulna in itself question number seven I'm sure you guys have appreciated this shoulder dislocation by the way which type anterior posterior inferior this is a classical inferior shoulder dislocation which is also called as luxatio erecta <clears throat> all right so this is a classical inferior shoulder dislocation also called as luxatio erecta and I'm sure you guys remember that there is a nerve which makes a loop around the surgical neck of humerus. By the way, what is that nerve called? Axillary nerve. So, answer is straight and clear. Axillary nerve. Alright. Now, question number 8. Talocalcaneo navicular joint is an example of. Very simple. I'm sorry. Very simple. It is a classical example of ball and socket joint. In fact, there are other ball and socket joints as well. There are other ball and socket joints as well. The mnemonic is called as this. Now when I say T, this is talocalcaneo navicular joint. H is for hip joint. I is for incudostapedial joint. S is for shoulder joint. Right, so tallow, calcaneo, navicular, hip, incubus, and shoulder. They all are examples of ball and socket joint.